Okay, we talk about respiratory physiology for a while. We'll go long enough tonight that I, I, uh, it's let's see, next week and uh, this Thursday. What's our lab? Um, it's your respiration lab. We'll go to the point that I think we can get done, you know, maybe take an hour at the beginning of the lab and finish the lab. Uh, okay, okay. Too, too late tonight. Yeah, uh, yeah, respiration. Respiration? Yeah, so that'll go into what we're looking at right now. Respiration system. You have the blood flow. Let's see. I'm going to come back to that other slide. It's divided into two zones. Respiratory zone of gas exchange. That's in the conduction zone. Air gets to the respiratory zone. The gas exchange takes place in the alveoli, in the bronchial, bron in the alveoli, in the bronchial alveoli. Uh, the conduction is through the mouth, through the larynx, down the trachea, down to the bronchioles, and so blood flow, you have pulmonary vein, pulmonary artery, here you have the bronchiole, you have the terminal bon bronchiole, here you have the respiratory bronchiole. The respiratory bronchiole is because you have alveoli that come off the respiratory bronchiole, it's the first place that you actually have oxygen exchange. Uh, then you have your capillary network on the surface of the alveoli, you have the pulmonary vein, and you have the pulmonary artery. Pulmonary artery is the only artery that carries what? The Deoxygenated blood. It's a trivial question. Pulmonary vein is the only vein that carries Oxygenated uh, The alveoli are sad little sacs at the end of the bronchial, respiratory bronchioles. They're clustered. You have, they're wrapped around with all the capillary. Um, you're coming in, you, you have two cell thicknesses. You have the one epithelial cell thickness of the alveoli and the one epithelial cell thickness of the capillary. So you get very good exchange of carbon dioxide and gas across that membrane. And this happens by what process? Diffusion. Good. Respiratory zone again. Site of gas exchange conduction is how it gets there. Okay, respiration is ventilation, gas exchange between blood and lungs, and between blood and tissue, oxygen utilization by tissues to make ATP. Oxygen is the final acceptor of what? Electron. Electron in the what? Electron transport system. That's why you suffocate. You don't have a something there to accept those electrons. To make the ATP, to keep the tissue, you know, to keep the body functioning. Ventilation and gas exchange in the lungs is external respiration. Oxygen utilization and gas exchange in the tissues is internal respiration. It occurs via diffusion. The OKO2 concentration in the, is higher in the lungs than in the blood, so it diffuses into the blood. The CO2 is higher in the blood than in the lungs, so it diffuses out of the blood and into the lungs. And this, that's a little more, this is a little simplified. It's a little more complicated than that because of the carbonic anhydrase and the pH will cause that to happen actually faster. Okay. Right. <laughs>
respiration serves as a means for the body to exchange atmosphere via the blood. The partial pressure of oxygen, PO2, in the air in the alveolar spaces in the lungs is greater than the PO2 in the blood, so oxygen diffuses into red blood cells from air in the lungs. Also, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, PCO2, in the air in the lungs is less than the PCO2 in the blood. So carbon dioxide diffuses out from red blood cells and into the air in the lungs. Oxygen-rich blood is carried through pulmonary veins to the heart and then pumped through systemic arteries to the body. The PO2 in the blood is higher than the PO2 in the body tissues, so oxygen diffuses out from red blood cells at the body tissues. Also, the PCO2 in the blood is lower than the PCO2 in the body tissues, so carbon dioxide diffuses into red blood cells there. Oxygen-poor blood is carried through systemic veins back to the heart and is pumped through pulmonary arteries to the lungs, where gas exchange again replenishes the blood with oxygen and removes <laughs> carbon dioxide. in the lungs, where gas exchange takes place. There's about 300 million of them. They provide a surface area of about 760 square feet. That's a lot of surface area. But that's why your exchange is so good and why you can, your capillaries are within uh, one cell of, of oxygen in the lungs. So in the alveoli, you have two different type of alveoli. You have the type 1, which is the big thing here. You have the type 2 alveoli, which secretes surfactant, phosphatidylcholine, phosphatidylglycine. We'll talk about that in a minute. Now, you know, I hate to get historic on you. But remember when we were back in the first lab and we started talking about bonds? What's the bond between the water molecules? Well, does it all come back to bite you? Hydrogen. If, and we'll get to this, but if there wasn't a surfactant, the bond force between the hydrogen molecules and the water in the lungs would be enough to collapse the alveoli. What's that? That's why. That's why. So what you have is you have the surfactant, which is, you know, kind of like the detergent, but it's phosphatidylcholine, phosphatidylglycine that decreases this bond strength and keeps the alveoli from uh, collapsing, which makes it easier for the lungs to expand and contract, and we'll get into that. Anyway, the macrophages here uh, absorb the excess fluid and sodium and potassium and chloride and things like that and get it out. So you're, it helps keep the alveoli from filling up with fluid. Your capillaries are here. You have essentially a one cell thickness between the capillary and the alveoli for the oxygen to diffuse in and the carbon dioxide to diffuse out. Uh, capillary within the alveolar wall. Here's a red blood cell. Remember your red blood cells are a biconcave disc. You get a little more surface area which again aids in the diffusion of CO2 and oxygen. But also being a biconcave disc as opposed to severe which gives the, sur the same surface area, uh, it's bendable, it's more malleable, it can fit through the capillaries. Type 1, 95 to 97% over your alveoli are type 1. 
That's where your gas exchange occurs. Type 2 secrete pulmonary surfactant and reabsorb sodium and water, preventing the fluid buildup. Actually, the macrophages pick up the bacteria and the crud that gets down into the alveoli. Conduction zone. The air travels down through the nasal cavity, through the pharynx, through the larynx, into the trachea, into the right and left primary bronchi, into the secondary, into the tertiary with more branching, into the terminal bronchioles. Then you hit your respiratory zone. The respiratory bronchioles are the first ones where you can actually have gas exchange. This is probably a pretty good test for And then you have the terminal alveolar sacs, the bulb of alveoli at the end of the bronchial. So here it is, your trachea, primary bronchus, your branches, down to the terminal bronchioles, and then from the terminal bronchioles into the respiratory bronchioles. The respiratory bronchioles, by definition, will have alveoli. Just another view. Function of the conduction zone. Transports air to the lungs. Warms and humidifies, filters and cleans the air. Even when you're out in below zero weather, your body is designed by the time that air hits the lungs to have it at body temperature and to have it at essentially 100% humidity. You don't want to be drying out your alveoli. Uh, I think it's one of the, uh, you know, the hardest things to be in zero degree weather and try to drink water to stay hydrated. It's very easily, uh, because you're not warm, you're not sweating, and it's very easily easy to become dehydrated. Anyway, in the transport in the conduction zone. It warms the, the air, it humidifies it, it filters it, and cleans the air. You have your cilia, your uh, trachea is lined with cilia, your bronchi are lined with cilia, and a thick mucus. Probably uh, ciliated epithelial cells, probably 300 cilia to the cell, beating in a wave-like motion up and out. They say particles bigger than about six microns can get trapped, and they get trapped in the mucus and the cilia, and they are, it moves at a couple of centimeters a minute, but it moves it up till you either swallow it or spit it out. Now it's uh, kind of interesting. One of the ways that parasites get in is they will get into, uh, like the schistosoma. If you're in Egypt in the Nile, you, know, you don't go barefoot in the Nile, you don't go swimming in the Nile, really. Because they get in through the pores of the skin. They get in through the skin, they get into the bloodstream. They get up to the bloodstream, to the lungs, and they, they get out of the alveoli <coughs> and they get into the bronchi and the cilia push them up. Then you <coughs> swallow, and you've just swallowed all these parasites. And now they're down in your intestine, which is a very good place for them to breed and expand, and then uh, the cycle begins all over again. Anyway, warms, humidifies, filters, cleans. Anything above about six microns can be trapped. The cilia will push it out. My grandfather started as a boy, seven-year-old, in the Welsh coal mines, pushing coal carts, because it was inhumane to have horses or donkeys or ponies underground. But they would have a seven-year-old boy pushing coal carts. Uh, ended up managing mines in Pennsylvania, but dealt with black lung his entire life. Black lung is from the coal dust, that is smaller than the six microns, and it's gotten down into the alveoli, and it's caused the fibrosis, and it's caused damage down there. Very, very common in, in uh, the coal miners. Is that disease that people get 
get, I think they're born with it, where eventually I think they maybe suffocate, mucus gets in there. Cystic body. fibrosis. Why does that happen? Like, what is it? We'll talk about by that, but what happens is there's an exchange of sodium and chloride in the alveoli that keeps pulling enough water in to keep the mucus in there dilute enough that it can be uh, passed out via the cilia. There is a problem with the gene that supplies the chloride and uh, this mucus gets real, real thick. And there's a special way that they teach a uh, cystic, cystic fibrotic child and even an adult with a bad chest cold and a lot of mucus is you start real deep and you do short coughs <laughs> until you break the mucus loose and then we're then cough out. And this is the way, this is how they teach the cystic fibrosis of people with cystic fibrosis to learn to do this constantly to get as much of that mucus out of the out of the alveoli, out of the bottom of the lung. But it's a chloride problem and the way we used to, and the way they still test for cystic fibrosis is we would do a sweat chloride test. We would put a big warm heating pad, we would clean the arm, put a big warm heating pad on and uh, make them sweat and then we would put two electrodes on it that measured the chloride concentration. In a cystic fibrosis child, the chloride concentration would go up through the roof. And this way it's called a sweat chloride test. So that's still, as far as I know, the main test for a cystic fibrosis. Though there might be a <coughs> genetic test for them. But that's what you're talking about, cystic fibrosis. So you use the other shorter legs, right? Yeah. Uh, mucus traps the small particles and the silica move it away from the lungs. Uh, voice production is in the larynx as air passes over the vocal folds. Um, I'm sure if you're in nursing and you're in the ER, you're going to see them perform a tracheotomy at some point, sometime. Uh, this is what you really don't want to hit. The vocal cords. You want to get down below them. Thoracic cavity contains the heart, the trachea, the esophagus, the thymus within the central mediastinum. Through here. The rest of the cavity is filled with the lungs. You have the parietal pleura, lines of the outside. You have the visceral pleura that's essentially covers the lungs and you can probably have a tough time dissecting it from the lungs. It's just essentially part of the lungs. The parietal and the visceral pleura are normally pushed together, uh, as it says in the book, like two pieces of wet glass kind of stuck together. And in between them is the intrapleural space, which is usually not much. Unless a lung collapses which can happen spontaneously, usually it's from a traumatic injury. Thoracic cavity. Uh, sternum, so there's your breastbone, there's your vertebrae in the back. You've got your heart, here's your parietal pleura, here are the green on the outside, the visceral pleura, the pleural cavity is right in between. Here's part of your, here's your esophagus to the stomach. Uh, again, you have your visceral pericardium and your parietal pericardium. That's the sac around the heart. It contains pericardial fluid. It cushions the heart. Uh, your visceral pericardium, uh, you know, like I said, you would have trouble dissecting that off the heart. It's pretty much attached right to the heart. And then the rest of this space is taken up with the lungs. You know, you got 750 square feet of, of uh, alveoli to fit in there, so it takes it takes most it takes all that space. There's really no there should be no space in there. There should be no air in there unless you get trauma, pneumothorax, knife wound, gunshot wound, um, something like that. <coughs> 
Here is a lung. You can see how much the lungs expand. Here's a lung not inflated. Let me make sure I've got this right. No. This is a female lung. You can see the outline of the breasts here. The size difference between the male lung and the female lungs. Size difference between the male and the female. Physical aspects of ventilation. Air moves from a higher to a lower pressure. When you breathe, your visceral and your peritoneal pleura are pretty much attached not only to the lungs, but also to the wall of the chest, to the intercostal muscles, to the sternal muscles. Um, we'll get into them. As you take a breath, your diaphragm drops, your ribs spread. As that opens up, it creates a negative pressure. When that pressure drops below the atmospheric pressure, air rushes in. And you're only talking about two or three, four millimeters of mercury difference. But it brings air in. When the muscles contract, it's the elasticity of the lungs that pull everything up back into the normal and push the air out. That's in a normal, normal breath. Pressure differences between the two ends of the conducting zone occur due to the changing lung volumes. Um, Trying to think of an analogy. Anybody got a good one? No. You expand it. As they said in uh, 20,000 leaves out of the sea? I don't know. God hates a vacuum. So when you expand it, you create a vacuum, it's going to fill it and the air is going to rush in. So that's what happens. Compliance is elasticity and surface tension are important physical properties of the lungs. We'll get into those. Pressure. What's that? I was just thinking you build it and they will come. Uh, I think that was field of dreams. No, yeah, no, it's no, a baseball right. field. No, but <laughs> <laughs> the expansion thing is like open it and the air will enter. Yeah. Find a, um, if you create a vacuum, it's, it's just going to it just happens. Atmospheric pressure, the pressure of the air outside the body, 716 milliliters, uh, excuse me, millimeters of mercury. Intrapulmonary pressure, pressure is that's in the lungs. Intrapleural pressure, that's the pressure in between the lung and the chest cavity. Now, the intrapulmonary pressure is always going to be a little bit higher than the intrapleural pressure. So what that is constantly doing is pushing the lungs against the, the wall of the pleural cavity. And then what happens is when you inhale, the pleural cavity becomes bigger because the muscles are pushing the diaphragm down, pushing the rib cage apart, pushing the rib cage out. Three-dimensionally, it's becoming bigger. At that point, the lungs are going with it. The lungs are expanding, drawing air into them because they're creating a negative pressure. They're dropping the pressure below that of the atmospheric pressure. Inhale, in. Inhalation, inhalation, intrapulmonary pressure is lower than the atmospheric pressure. So air is going to go in. You've created a vacuum. <coughs> pressure below that of the atmospheric is called subatmospheric, okay, or negative pressure. Exhalation, you're pushing down. The muscles, the elasticity of the lungs are pulling the diaphragm up, the rib cage back, uh, making it smaller 
creating a higher pressure inside the lungs than is outside the lungs. And at that point, it's pushing air out or exhaling air. Now, what are two things that we do pretty regularly that are kind of the opposite of that? Where do you have air forced into your lungs regularly? As a sport. Scuba diving. When you start to breathe, the regulator will give you a shot of air, or else you would spend all your time trying to suck air out of that tank. So the regulator and the tank under pressure forces the breath into your mouth. The same thing is for with fighter pilots and their oxygen masks. It's a positive. But anyway, you, you expand the chest, you create a vacuum, you contract the chest, you create pressure, you move air back and forth. Is that sort of like the breathing things use at night when you have the CPAP? The CPAP is, is a pressure because you, you know, before I had my stomach operation, I used CPAP. And yes, it's positive airway pressure because what's happening is the glottis net is falling into uh, in place and blocking the breathing, so you desat on your oxygen saturation, and so this keeps it open that you, you know, positive airway pressure. So yeah, constant positive uh, airway pressure. Oh yeah. Are you super loud? Yeah, sometimes. Some of them, mine wasn't. My wife snores so loud that it just... <laughs> if she, I, was work, I, was, I was working on a lesson the other night. And I turned on the computer that had this recorded. So, yeah, my wife's sodium content is so low. She passes it and I'm going, oh God, I hope she doesn't hear me talking about her. <laughs> but as usual, she was ignoring me. So. Anyway, uh, but when I found that I was waking up, when they did the sleep test, I mean, they cut off after about three hours. He said, you're so bad, you're so bad. But uh, I didn't know how much I was waking up until I got a good night's sleep with it on. And uh, it made a tremendous difference. So you don't have to use it now at all? No. And from sleep apnea from being overweight? Well, uh, yeah, with the snoring and sleep apnea, I'd wake myself up every seven to ten minutes all night long. It was terrible. You know, it pushes your blood pressure up, and it's just, you know, uh, yeah. My husband's not overweight at all, and he has that. He's waking up every seven to ten minutes. Yeah. 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 Is he on CPAP? No, he refuses to wear it. Someone's going to kill him. He's a grown man. He can't do anything. Tell my wife that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, yeah, so what does that mean? Same thing. It'll be probably a physical, uh, an anatomical problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then your uh, CAT retainer, you also use Well, you would use that to just simply be able to blow off the CAT. I don't know if that's the you know, clinical definition of what you're using. But that sounds like. Okay. The pressure differences. It's not much. You know, you're only talking about a few millimeters of mercury, where the total air pressure from the atmosphere is 760. But it doesn't take much to move to move the air. Three maybe six uh, millimeters of mercury. Intrapleural pressure, lower than intrapulmonary pressure. Like I said, the pressure in the pleural space is less. The pressure in the lungs is more. It keeps the lungs plastered out against the pleural cavity, the pleural wall. The difference uh, between the two is transpulmonary pressure. Uh, what you know, the take-home message here is that pressure keeps the lungs expanded, and when you take a breath, it allows it 
pushes the lungs apart and allows the lungs to stay expanded and not collapse or have the alveoli collapse when you exhale. Boyle's Law. I will tell you when I give you the review what laws you need to know and not know. Uh, but I'm not, this chapter we've got about 1,600 different laws. Boyle's Law, Henry's Law, Pascal's Law. Uh, Boyle's Law, you probably need to know. States that the pressure of a gas is inversely proportional to its volume. So what does that mean? If I take a small balloon and I put a liter of gas in it, and it's contained in this smallest space, the size of, say, a softball. I push a liter of gas. Gas compresses. So the pressure is going to go up in there. Okay? If I take that liter of gas and I put it into a basketball, it's not going to exert much pressure at all because it's able to expand. It's not, uh, you know, it's going to expand to the size of the basketball. It's not going to exert pressure. If I move that down to the size of a softball or the size of a baseball or a tennis ball, that pressure is going to go way up. What Boyle's Law says is that the pressure inside that um, for the same amount of gas, if it's in a larger area, the pressure is going to be a lot lower. If it's in a small area, the pressure is going to be a lot higher. Increase in lung volume during inspiration decreases the intrapulmonary pressure. So I've got this much, see, my lungs are two liters, and I've got air in them, and it's got pretty atmospheric pressure. If I take a deep breath and I expand my lungs to four liters, the pressure in the, in the lungs by Boyle's Law, state, Bill Boyle's Law states that the pressure is going to go down, okay? Just because you've expanded it. There's not as much air to fill it. The pressure is going to go down. Once it gets below atmospheric pressure, it's going to pull air in from the outside because it's going to equalize it. There it goes in. The decrease in lung volume during exhalation increases intrapulmonary pressure and pushes it out. So as I make the chest cavity smaller, the pressure goes up, and when it gets higher than the pressure on the outside, it's going to push it out. Just like in the heart. When the ventricles are filling, the pressure in the aorta is higher than that of the ventricle. So your semilunar valves stay closed. They're pushed back up against the, uh, the ventricle. When the ventricles contract, the pressure in the ventricle gets higher than that of the aorta, and it pushes the valves open, and the blood flows out into the aorta. When the ventricles relax, the back pressure of the aorta goes back and closes the valve again. Okay? Lungs expand when stretched. Uh, define a change in lung volume for change in transpulmonary pressure. I'm not going to even worry about that. Just know that as they expand, the pressure goes down, air goes in. They contract, the pressure goes up, air is going up. Reduced by infiltration of connective tissues, proteins, pulmonary fibrosis. The hardening of the lungs. Sarcoid is another one. It's a fibrosis uh, where the lungs become fibrotic. They do not expand. They lose their elasticity. Uh, and people just can't breathe. You're also looking at... Uh, various lung diseases like emphysema, where the fibrosis actually gets to the point that it breaks down the alveolar wall, and instead of, instead of having millions of alveoli in there, it creates a lot less but much bigger alveoli. At that point, you don't have room for the capillaries to exchange blood. 
you exchange oxygen. Your oxygen exchange goes way down. We will get to that. What, what makes pulmonary fibrosis? Usually, it's uh, some sort of damage, and generally, it's smoking. Smoking so it's not or... What? It's not like a genetic thing. Generally not, no. Smoking, uh, the coal miners would get it. They would cut, the black lung would cause a fibrosis. Uh, if you worked in and around shipyards with asbestos, that will deal, do it. Uh, people that are working with sheetrock and sheetrock dust. And if it becomes cancerous, then it's called a mesothelioma. And uh, then that's that's really nasty. That's what well, you guys are. Well, yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you. He died. He was in the merchant marine, and at that point, they coated the inside of all the merchant marine vessels with asbestos, and he died. That's what killed him. What about like sometimes when I'll clean the bathroom? And I'm washing the walls and stuff with bleach. I'll have like a sore throat the next day and kind of like. That's that's a reaction to the chlorine <coughs> irritating. Is that like really bad for your lungs? That is very bad for your lungs. <laughs> yes. Mix it with the ammonia. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, a little ammonia. I mean, I used to acid wash pools when I was in high school. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it really came out nice, but it was tough. Yeah, Wear a respirator and all that. What should you wear? You, wear some kind of you need a respirator. Yeah, uh, you can get a good respirator that will cut down a lot. So wear a respirator when you clean your bathroom. When I clean the bathroom. You can't clean them. Yeah. Or just I stop cleaning. Stop cleaning, cleaning the bathroom. bathroom. I mean, you know, there's the answer right there. Uh, elasticity. The lungs are very elastic. You know, according to the book in other places, about a hundred times more elastic than a balloon. I mean, you know, they're, you're taking 60 breaths a minute for a hundred years, it better be elastic. Um, okay. 20 breaths. At most. 60 beats. Yeah, I get them. Don't worry about it. They have a lot of elastic. Okay, back. They have a lot of elastic pipes. They're stuck to the thoracic wall. They are always under elastic tension. They're a little bit stretched. They go back and forth. You get an irritation of pleuritis in there. That's when you'll get a rubbing, you'll get an irritation and fill with fluid. Then we end up going in, putting a chest tube in, uh, tapping it, and then dealing with the reason. But we've got to get the fluid off. Or else you're, it's just like you're going into contestant heart failure. And that's, uh, actually we'll talk about that in one of the later chapters. Surface tension. Resist distension ex exerted by fluid secreted in the alveoli. Raises the pressure of the alveoli air as it acts to collapse the alveoli. This is your surfactant. Coats the alveoli. It uh, keeps the alveoli from collapsing when you exhale. Uh, this raises the pressure of the alveolar air. It essentially interferes with the hydrogen bonding and decreases the surface tension of the, or the water tension in the alveoli. It's the surfactant, it's the phosphatidylcholine, uh, phosphatidylglycine. This is what we measure in newborns, in preemie newborns, to decide if the lungs are mature enough to have, uh, to breathe air. And this is, uh, you know, there, there are babies that have seen them work very hard to not deliver until the lungs are mature enough or until they've given the mother enough that it's gotten into the baby's lungs and uh, added enough surfactant that they could breathe. Law of Laplace. Pressure is directly proportional to the surface tension 
and inversely proportional to the radius of the alveoli. line. What this says is essentially without, and don't even worry about this one. This one. Oh, I'm sorry. Why don't you just put a big X through that high line? I am. <laughs> it says essentially that in the small alveoli without the surfactant would collapse <laughs> simply because the pressure exerted by the hydrogen bonds in the water in the alveoli. The surfactant stops that. In the newborn, the lungs are filled with fluid, not air. Until they start breathing, the lungs are filled with fluid. The eraser will not work on the highlight. Okay. If you do you do you want a math question on the test? At the end of expiration, barometric air pressure and alveolar air pressure are equal. Therefore, no movement of air into or out of the lungs takes place. Inspiration begins with contraction of inspiratory muscles to increase thoracic volume. <laughs> this results in expansion of the lungs and an increase in alveolar volume. The increased alveolar volume causes a decrease in alveolar pressure below barometric air pressure, and air flows into the lungs. Boils. At the end of inspiration, the thorax and alveoli stop expanding. Air flow into the lungs causes alveolar pressure to become equal to barometric air pressure. Because the pressures become equal, no more movement of air occurs. During expiration, the volume of the thorax decreases as the diaphragm relaxes and the thorax and lungs recoil. This results in a decrease in alveolar volume and an increase in alveolar pressure. Since the alveolar pressure is now greater than barometric air pressure, air flows out of the lungs. Air continues to flow out of the lungs until alveolar pressure becomes equal to barometric pressure. Okay, talk about surfactant, but we've done this. Well, secreted by the type 2 alveolar cells. That'd probably be a pretty good test question there, too. Know. What cells secrete surfactant? Which ones? Type 2 alveolar Wouldn't that be a good quick test question? And the surfactant hydrophobic protein phospholipids reduces the surface tension again. More concentrated in the small, it prevents the bottom line, prevents the collapse of the, of the alveolar. That's why you need the surfactants. Did you get it? Okay. This is just a diagram of the same thing. Your surfactant is here, your alveoli, your macrophages are here collecting particles. Um, again, I think I just needed to put something, fill a page in the book. Surfactant begins late in the fetal life. Um, Premature babies may be born with a high risk of alveolar collapse called respiratory distress syndrome or hyaline membrane disease. That's the old term, respiratory distress syndrome, RDS is the new term. Figure if you're below 28 weeks, something like that, probably 60% of the babies will have RDS. You go up to about 30 weeks, 32 weeks, 30% of the babies will have it. You get over 34 weeks, then you're down to about 5% up through, up through the river. So if you have a mother that's at 32 weeks, what we're going to do is they're going to tap, and they're looking, going to look for the phosphatidylcholine or phosphatidylglycine in the amniotic fluid. If we see it there and the baby's in distress, they'll go ahead and deliver it. In the meantime, they can give mom the surfactant, it will get into the baby's lungs, 
and uh, at, you know, very fairly quickly get to the point that the baby will be able to breathe when it's uh, when it's delivered, and then they'll go ahead and do the C-section or do the pit drip and cause the baby to be delivered. Mechanics of breathing. Where am I? Pulmonary ventilation, inspiration, breathe in, expiration, breathe out. Expiration in this uh, context is not expiration like kicking the bucket. Okay, when we talk about this, we're simply talking about breathing out. Accomplished by changing the thoracic cavity lung volume. I think we've been through that. Okay, here is a non-expanded lung. Here is a deep breath, expanded lung. Coming all the, this is the air. The darkness is the air in the lung. This is an outline of where it was. So you can see the amount of uh, how much bigger your lungs are. And this is only two-dimensional. You know, it's also expanding in the third dimension, too. Muscles. The diaphragm is the most important. Concave muscle, bottom of the thoracic cavity. Contracts on inspiration, relaxes on expiration. You have the external and intercostals and, uh, that contract on inspiration. You have the internals uh, on expiration. Those are moving the rib cage. So here you have your external intercostals, your internal between the ribs, uh, sternocleidomastoid, those are scalenes, those are fairly minor with inspiration. Your diaphragm is your big muscle. Your internal on expiration, external abdominal muscles. Now are there sometimes uh, if you, somebody has a breathing problem, a lot of times they will deal with the off one, which opens the airways, uh, helps get oxygen into the alveoli, but they will do it along with exercise, simply because the additional tone to your abdominal muscles and that help in moving the diaphragm back and forth. That's where exercise... Uh, will at some point, or to a certain extent, help uh, with some of the breathing. Inspiration. Uh, okay. We expand the thoracic cavity. We, we relax the thoracic cavity. We got that? Normal force versus force of breathing. Normal contraction is mostly, it's just the diaphragm and external intercostal, uh, and the relaxation of the diaphragm and the muscles because of the elasticity of the lung, the lung you exhale. Forced, uh, you, you're contracting the scalene, the sternocleidomastoid muscles, you decrease the pulmonary pressure to probably about a minus 20 millimeters. Normally, on a normal breathing, it's about a minus 3 millimeters mercury. So you can force more air into the lung. Aided by the, the contraction, expiration by the contraction of the abdominal muscles, you're pushing the air out, and the internal intercostal muscles. Now, it's interesting. One of the things that they train you for in endurance, and you know, I did it with, uh, with cross-country skiing and that, is you don't concentrate on breathing in. That'll happen. You concentrate on breathing out. You want to push as much CO2 out as possible. And, uh, and that's, that's what they were teaching us. And that's where your abdominal and your intercostal muscles uh, come into play. I think we've been through this. Pulmonary function test. This is what we're going to do in the lab. Uh, 
Spirometry, we're going to measure the air in and out. Uh, we aren't using a spirogram. Uh, don't think we're using a newer one. I don't, we're not using the old spirogram. We used to have a, essentially an upside down tub, and when we push air out, we push it up and down in a water bath, and we measure the volume that way. Still kind of the same thing. Measures the lung volumes. Diagnose restrictive and disruptive lung disorders. Restrictive is the inability to, you don't have the volume. Disruptive is in the inability to move the air. Lung volume measurements. Tidal volume. Uh, you know, I'm going to go past this because I'm going to explain it again on Thursday when we do the lab. We're going to go through tidal expiratory reserve, inspiratory reserve, all this stuff. Vital capacity, total lung capacity, functional residual. Uh, these we're going to all go through when we do the lab. Restrictive and obstructive dis disorders. Restrictive lung tissue is damaged. Vital capacity is reduced, which means you just can't bring as much air in. The forced expiration is normal. The bronchioles, you can move the air just fine. You just don't have a place to put it. Obstructive lung tissue is normal. Vital capacity is normal, but forced expiration is reduced. Asthma, I have a small bronchial obstruction, probably from years when I started in the lab of exposure to formaldehyde. And I'm sure, like you were saying, with the chlorine and the bleach, I'd come away coughing. And it was before we had safety equipment and all that. So at some point, I may have more problems. We'll see. Forced expiratory, expiratory expiratory volume, FEV. This is how fast you can move, or how easily you can move lung, move air through the system. So you're going to take a deep breath, and they're going to say, blow, blow it all out, and they're going to see how much you can move in a minute. And this measures the ability to, not for the lung to hold air, but your ability to move air in and out of the lung. Asthma. Shortness of breath and wheezing caused by inflammation, mucus secretion, and constriction of the bronchioles. Often called airway hyperresponsive. The thing about asthma, as opposed to what I have, is asthma you can treat with a bronchodilator. You can treat with epinephrine, you can treat with the oxalate, you can treat with Singulair, something like that. It will respond. Mine will not. Mine's a physical damage. Allergic asthma triggered by allergens stimulating the T lipid. Lymphocytes to secrete cytokines, recruiting eosinophils, mast cells. This is all part of the allergic reaction. We will get into that more when we get into the immunology next time in Chapter 15. They contribute to the inflammation. The inflammation uh, contributes to the buildup of mucus, and all of a sudden you're having trouble breathing. Be triggered by cold or dry air. Reversible with a bronchodilator, albuterol. It'll give it to you in a little uh, vaporizer and you, you breathe it in a few times a day. Is there anything you can do, like, for a past, like, because I did that, that would be helpful, or that you did that, or just it's done? Or something? Kind of a done deal, as far as I know, or I would have done it. <clears throat> they just. When I talk to the pulmonologist, he says, well, yeah, you got a little bit of it. <clears throat> You'll probably have some breathing problems later in life. But mine's physical. I mean, I can, do a, I can do a pulmonary function test and look and see that I have a, not poor, but at least a decrease there. So get the weight off, maintain the, you know, get the exercise maintain the tonicity of the muscles in the chest and the diaphragm and that and see what happens. Chronic obstruction of pulmonary disease, COPD, chronic inflammation, narrowing of the airways, 
and alveolar destruction, emphysema, chronic obstructive bronchitis, accelerated decline in FEVs. Your chronic obstructive, your COPD, is usually some sort of physical damage. Me, it might be, I think, it might be formaldehyde. A lot of people, it's simply smoking. Excessive mucus production, inflammation triggered by smoking. Most people with COPD smoke. Promotes the infiltration of obstructing fibrous tissue in the airways, uh, remodeling of blood vessels in the lungs, leading to pulmonary hypertension. You've got, you're getting fibrosis, you're, you've, uh, you're losing your capillaries, so what happens is every time the right ventricle of the heart beats, it's pushing all this blood through the lungs. Now remember when we showed you in the last chapter, part of keeping the pressure down is the fact that it comes in in the artery and then branches out to hundreds or thousands of capillaries, spreading that pressure out. Well, if you get remodeling of the blood vessels in the lung, you don't have all these capillaries. And the pressure builds up and you get what they call pulmonary hypertension. There is no cure. Fifth leading cause of death right now. They figure in 20 or 30 years it will be up to the second or third leading cause of death. <coughs> emphysema, destruction of the alveoli. What happens with emphysema, like I said earlier, the alveoli are broken down and you form essentially <coughs> fewer but larger alveoli. And you don't have a surface area for the capillaries to wrap around and exchange oxygen. Uh, fewer alveoli put pressure on the bronchioles to collapse during expiration. Smoking again is the cause. Uh, triggers inflammation, destruction of the alveoli by the immune or the mast cells. Here is emphysema. Here is a normal lung. These are your alveoli. There is emphysema. You know, I can show you, I have two sons that smoke, and they just, they don't do anything. If they stop smoking, can they reverse some of the effects? Some of it, yeah. But at some point, it gets to the point that it simply won't work. COPD pretty much doesn't reverse emphysema. If they stop early enough, they can reverse it. I don't think, you know, when I was giving, getting my grade school and high school movies on smoking, you know, the moment you stop, it starts reversing. I don't think it's quite that optimistic. But, uh, when I was in the military, uh, they used to tell us the lung to smoke, well, at one place. That would be about right. And, you know, when I lived in San Clemente and ran all over camp, stuck on Camp Pendleton or ran all over Camp Pendleton, every sea ration box had five cigarettes, had a box of five cigarettes in it. Mm -hmm. They gave them out because, you know, so lots change. Lots change. Pulmonary fibrosis, we talked about that a little bit earlier. It's consists just it's a hardening of the lungs. You get an increase of the fibrotic tissue in the lungs. They can't expand. They get stiff. Physically, a coal miner, black lung does it. Uh, immunologically, sarcoid, that type of a disease would give you a fibrotic or a very stiff or hardening of the lungs. Gas exchange in the lungs. What page are we? 539. Five what? 539. Okay, how far are we through? Uh, I think we're going up to 560. Yeah, 560. Okay. You have a 16th page on 50. Right, that's a little bit of a paragraph. Oh, we're almost done, right? No, no. But there's a bunch of diagrams. Okay, we'll go on for a little bit. Sorry. 
Gas exchange in the lungs. You, you, wrong answer. Uh, measured using a barometer. At sea level, the atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury. Why do we use mercury? Because if you did this in a glass tube with water, it'd be 33 feet, not 760 millimeters. That's how much of the barometric pressure or the pressure of the gas pushed on. Atmospheric pressure pushing here pushes it up into a vacuum. You get the 760 millimeters. Dalton's law, total pressure of a gas, just, you don't need to memorize this. Total pressure of a gas mixture is equal to the sum of the pressures of each gas. So, if I have 760 millimeters of mercury and 72% of the uh, atmosphere is nitrogen, who's got a calculator? We don't need to. 700 72% of 760 is the pressure put, up, put on by the nitrogen. 21% of the atmosphere is oxygen. 21% of that 760 millimeters of mercury is from oxygen. That's all Dalton's law says. I don't remember what nitrogen is. 72, 74 percent, something. Total pressure, 78% no, is nitrogen, 21% is uh, O2, 1% CO2, the rest are minor gases. Now, you have to change the equation because when it gets into lungs, you also have to add the water pressure. Partial pressure, uh, just know that pressure of the air going into the lungs is reflective of the atmospheric pressure. For instance, at sea level it's 760 millimeters of mercury. At 10,000 feet, uh, or say at the top of Mount Everest, it's 400 millimeters of mercury, 300 millimeters of mercury, something like that. So you don't have the atmospheric pressure to force air into your lungs. And the percentage of that, that is oxygen, goes down uh, at the same ratio. So at air at sea level, you, your O2 is 150 millimeters of mercury. That's what's pushing oxygen into the lungs. In the alveoli, the percentage of oxygen decreases, CO2 increases. We've already talked about that. It's exchanging. So this is just a diagram of the inspired air. CO2 is much lower in the inspired air because it's only 1% of the atmosphere. In the alveolar air, it's much higher because you're getting all the CO2 waste out of the system. O2, much higher in the atmosphere. It, the O2 is going into the system, so it's dropping. Nitrogen, not much change. Total pressure, again, the same. But what's happening is the inspired air is getting into the lung. You're getting the exchange of gases. So CO2 coming into the lung is negligible. Coming out of the lung is at 40 millimeters of mercury. O2 coming in at 159, coming out, uh, exhaled at 105. Nitrogen, 601, 568. The thing is, it all has to add up. They all have to add up to be the same as 760. Uh, okay, here we go. Uh, Mount Everest is 29,000 plus feet, so instead of having 760 millimeters of mercury atmospheric pressure, you're down to 226. That's why they're wearing oxygen up there. There's not enough air to breathe. So instead of at a sea level having 159 millimeters of oxygen, you have 47 at 30,000 feet. Uh, Mount Everest is 29,029 feet. Probably a little bit higher than that.
because I know a couple of people that have climbed it, and they always carry a few pebbles up to put on the top of the mountain when they go up there. Then they take a few pieces of good luck off the top of the mountain. So anyway, this is this is why uh, you know they're ending up carrying oxygen. Uh, halo, high altitude, low opening, parachutes from uh, you know, special forces and that. You know, they always go out on oxygen because until you get down below about 15,000 feet, there's not enough. And if you don't go out with it, you can't fall fast enough to not suffocate by the time you get down to 15,000 feet. So, it used to be a big problem. Uh, my dad would see it in World War II with uh, bomber crews. Those planes, you know, they ended up having to bail out at 20 or 20, 25,000 feet. They didn't know enough not to pull the chutes at that time. They just didn't know what was going on. So they, they suffered a lot of these problems. Partial pressure in the blood. The alveoli and blood capillaries quickly reach equilibrium. When you inhale, You've got so much surface area in the alveoli that the oxygen and, L and CO2 are exchanged very rapidly. Maximize the amount of gas dissolved in the fluid. Henry's law predicts this. And Henry's law is the amount of gas that can dissolve in a liquid depends on the solubility of the gas. That's a constant. Temperature of the fluid in cold water, you can uh, it holds a lot more oxygen. That's why fish can survive under the ice. The cold water holds a lot more oxygen than warm water. You get a pond that rises to 70 or 75 degrees, you've got a cold water fish like a trout, they're going to die. You get a warm water fish like a bass or a, a, a catfish, they'll do just fine, and even higher, something like a carp that handles warm water even better. Partial pressure of the gas, determines is a determining factor. What's that? Uh, you know, I don't think I'd worry about him. But at least listen to him, okay? Oh, I just want to know whether or not you have to Actually, yeah, solubility of the gas because of the temperature in that. Yeah, you probably don't know. And so in cold, you can put more gas in the cold. Uh, the body temperature uh, used to be in, uh, before they took you into surgery in the 70s and early 80s, they wanted you as cool as possible. Uh, now they've decided that's wrong, and now they put you on a heater before they take you into surgery. Put you in a big suit, and hook up a hose, and like, it's like you're hooked up to a blow dryer. Uh, they call it some sort of a bear. System. Isn't it bear pond? Yeah. Bear. Bear. Bear pond. Yeah, bear mm -hmm. pond. That's it. Relationship between alveoli and capillaries. Tell me we haven't seen this one before. Okay. Then we're going. Blood gas measurement. What we do, and this is. about 40 years out of date. But you still have to calibrate your instruments. You're going to bubble 100%. We had a tonometer. You bubble 100% oxygen uh, through your liquid. You would use that to calibrate. You would adjust for barometric pressure. And it calibrated really at about 150 millimeters of mercury. Then you're going to put the probe into the blood or in in cases today, you simply take the blood and you push it out of the syringe into the machine, and it measures the amount of dissolved oxygen. You put in the hemoglobin or matocrit, the newer machines measure it at the same time, and it gives you your PO2, or partial pressure. When it's P in front of it, it means partial pressure. So PO2 is a partial pressure of the oxygen in the blood. Blood gas measurements measure the oxygen dissolved in the blood plasma. It does not measure the oxygen in the red blood cells. 
that uh, we would calculate with the hematocrit or the red cell count, hemoglobin and hematocrit. Does not does provide a good measurement of lung function. If partial pressure of oxygen in blood is more than five millimeters below that of the lungs, the gas exchange is impaired. So the lungs is gonna is going to have the same partial pressure as the outside atmosphere. So if you're at sea level, it's you know 760 millimeters of mercury or 159, excuse me, of oxygen. If you do a blood gas and you don't have something close to that inside, you know that the oxygen in the blood, excuse me, you know the oxygen is not getting from the lungs into the blood for one reason or another. Partial pressure of the gas, uh, you have the capillaries, you have the uh, right atrium and ventricle, pumping blood to the lungs. Venous blood from the pulmonary artery, capillaries in the alveoli, you have PO2 going in to the blood, you have CO2 coming out. Goes back to the left atrium and ventricle out to the body. You have CO2 going into the blood, oxygen coming out, and the cycle con continues. These numbers, I'm not asking you to calculate them, but you probably ought to have a good idea of the difference between the PO2 and the PO PCO2 between oxygenated and venous blood. Pulmonary circulation. I think we've been through this about 700 times. We'll go through quickly. At rest, your heart's pumping about five and a half liters a minute. About one total body volume of blood per minute goes through the heart. The difference between the left atrium and the pulmonary artery is only about 10 millimeters of mercury. You don't need a lot of pressure push the blood through the pulmonary system. Unless you have pulmonary hypertension. You've got the emphysema, you've got the remodeling of your blood vessels, the blood can't flow through the pulmonary system, the heart has to work harder, you do an echocardiogram, you see that right ventricle thickening because the muscle has to get stronger to push the blood through the, uh, through the pulmonary system. At that point, uh, you're looking at angina, and uh, you better do something about that because it's going to cause big problems down the road. Uh, vascular uh, pressure difference, it's 10 milligrams. Vascular resistance, very low, because it only takes 10 milligrams of mercury of pressure to push the blood through that. Low pressure, uh, low resistance, the blood moves quickly, easily, reduces the possibility of edema because it's, remember when you have high blood pressure on one side of the capillary, low on the other, not only does it push the red cells through, it pushes fluid out of the blood into the uh, surrounding tissue. So you get interstitial fluid. You don't want that happening in the lung because that causes a pulmonary edema. It starts blocking and uh, collapses the alveoli, and all of a sudden when you breathe, you feel this gurgling deep down inside. That's fluid in the lungs. That is not a good thing. That's when they put you on Lasix uh, to, to get the fluid off and digitalis to increase the heart contractility. Pulmonary circulation, pulmonary arterioles constrict when alveolar partial pressure of O2 is low. Now this is an excellent test question. Any place else in the body? Yeah, let's start by and, and I'll try to remember to put it on the test. Any place else in the body, if you have low O2 concentration, your vessels are going to dilate. 
because that organ is going to want as much oxygen as it can get, and if it has more blood at a lower oxygen concentration, it's still getting its oxygen. In the lung, the opposite occurs, because in the various parts of the lung, if you've got low O2 pressure, and you leave those capillaries wide open, you're going to get CO2 that's going to come in. It's not going to exchange because you don't have the O2 to exchange it with. And so it's going to push this CO2 laden belly right back into the arterial system and out into the body. So in the lungs, if they say, if they have an area of the lungs that's having poor perfusion, those capillaries are going to constrict. <coughs> so that the blood is going through the part of the lung that has good O2 perfusion and you're still able to exchange the oxygen. Okay? So that is the one place in the body where if the, P, if the PO2 is low, the vessels will actually constrict and not expand as it would in the other organs of the body. The opposite uh, blood flow to alveoli are increased when they are full of oxygen, decreased when they're not. Opposite of systemic arterioles that constrict when the partial pressure in O2 is high. Uh, this ensures only tissues that need oxygen are sent blood. So let's go back to that for a second. Pulmonary arterioles constrict when alveolar pressure O2 is low because it doesn't want to push CO2 back in. It's going to run the blood through where the oxygen is. They dilate when the partial pressure is high, so because there's plenty of oxygen to go through all the, cap the blood and all the capillaries. Blood flow to the alve alveoli is increased when they're full of oxygen and decreased when they're not. If the alveoli, again, if the alveoli have oxygen, the body's going to run blood through, get the exchange to take place. If there's no oxygen there for some reason or another, it's going to shunt the blood or it's going to uh, restrict those capillaries so the blood goes to where there is oxygen. Opposite of the systemic arterioles that constrict when the partial pressure of oxygen in the tissues is high. If there's too much oxygen in the tissue, they're going to constrict and, and not have as much oxygen in the tissue. They're going to dilate when the oxygen is low. Uh, if this also ensures that tissues that need oxygen are sent blood. So if you've got a high oxygen content in some tissue, more than it needs, it's going to constrict so there's more oxygen in the system to go to the other tissues that need it. Arterial response to O2. Low oxygen depolarizes smooth muscles of the arterial wall by inhibiting the outward flow of potassium. Wait a minute, what does the outward flow of potassium do? Depolarizes? I'm sorry, outward flow hyperpolarizes, which keeps the muscle around the arterial from contracting, which allows the arterial to expand, which allows more blood through. Same with the calcium gated, voltage gated calcium channels. This opens up voltage gated calcium channels, which stimulates, uh, I'm sorry, I had it backwards. In response to O2, they're going to contract. Low oxygen depolarizes smooth muscle cells of the arterial wall by inhibiting the outward flow of potassium. Uh, opens voltage-gated channels, which stimulate contraction. This would be for low O2. This would be for high O2. Response pulmonary arterioles to low oxygen. If they have, essentially, you don't have to memorize this. If they have low oxygen, it's going to shut the blood to where there's high oxygen. And you see that it's mainly, mainly the upper part does not have it, 
you have lower ventilation up in the apex, and as you can see, you have much lower blood flow. Down in the base, you have higher ventilation and a much higher blood flow. That's the take home message. You don't have to memorize these. Fresh air entering the lung carries oxygen with a PO2 of 160. The presence of moisture in the lung results in reduction of the PO2 to 104. Fresh air entering the lung carries carbon dioxide with a PCO2 of 0.3. The carbon dioxide delivered to the lung from the blood raises the PCO2 to 40. At the arterial ends of the pulmonary capillaries, oxygen diffuses from the air in the alveoli into the blood, and carbon dioxide diffuses from the blood into the alveoli because of differences in partial pressures. As a result of diffusion, at the venous ends of the pulmonary capillaries, the PO2 in the blood is equal to the PO2 in the alveoli, and the PCO2 in the blood is equal to the PCO2 in the alveoli. With no differences in partial pressure, there is no more net movement of oxygen or carbon dioxide. Oxygen diffuses out of the arterial ends of tissue capillaries into the tissue fluid, then into the cells, and carbon dioxide diffuses out of the cells into the tissue fluid then into the blood because of differences in partial pressures. At the venous ends of tissue capillaries, the PO2 in the blood is equal to the PO2 in the tissue fluid, and the PCO2 in the blood is equal to the PCO2 in the tissue fluid, resulting in no more net movement of oxygen or carbon dioxide. The blood now carries the oxygen and carbon dioxide to the lungs. In the body, all of these exchanges occur simultaneously. Okay, disorders by high partial pressures. Remember, at sea level, your partial pressure, your, your total atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury. You go down 10 meters, that doubles. You go down 20 meters, that triples. Uh, and 30 meters, that quadruples. So, what happens is at 10 meters, your partial pressure of oxygen is not 160 or 159 millimeters of mercury, it's 310, 320 millimeters of mercury. That's not a problem. The problem is the nitrogen. The nitrogen, well, that can't be a problem, because that's, if you can get oxygen toxicity, the nitrogen, because of the increased pressure, is forced into the blood. Uh, but let's, let's, let's go back, step back here. Problems for deep sea divers. Oxygen toxicity. 100% oxygen is dangerous at 2.5 atmospheres. You get too much. You get oxidation of enzymes. You get what they call rapture of the deep. <coughs> you are, you lose, you become, you lose your sense of direction. You, uh, at some point you will go unconscious, but you, you get kind of goofy. You get a lot goofy. There are people that you know, will swim down until they drown because I can yell at Peter, you, right after the deep. I don't know why I'm asking. Right. I'm just, it's just whatever. Oh, God, the 60s were a long time ago. Oxygen toxicity. You can't have oxygen toxicity. You don't breathe 100% oxygen. Very dangerous. Nitrogen narcosis occurs if nitrogen is in, inhaled under pressure, dizziness, drowsiness. 
The big thing with deep sea divers, even scuba divers, depending on how long they're down, even at moderate depths, is that nitrogen, because it's under pressure, dissolves in the blood. If you come up too quickly, that nitrogen undissolves and forms bubbles in the blood. This is what you call the bends. And these bubbles get into the alveoli, they get into the circulatory system, extremely painful, and can very easily kill you. The only way to treat that is to get these people back into a hyperbaric chamber, get them increase the atmospheric pressure until you force that nitrogen back into uh, the blood as part of the blood, not as a gas bubble, and then slowly bring them up and let them decompress, let it come up slowly, they breathe it off and they're fine. With scuba divers, you have decompression stops. You come up, and I, I forget how far. Is there a scuba in scuba divers here? I haven't gone in a very long time. It's, it's, it's like every 20 meters or something like that. You stop and wait for 10 minutes, and you decompress. Then you come up further, you stop, you wait, and decompress. You have to allow for that in, uh, in the area of your tanks. Now, there are the pearl divers, the women pearl divers in Japan who go down 40, 50 meters uh, because they're not taking in any more oxygen than they took in at sea level. They can do that and not have the problem. The problem is scuba divers, deep sea diver, hard hat divers, because they're taking in <coughs> oxygen and air under, under this increased pressure. Free divers wouldn't do it because they're only taking in as much, much nitrogen as they had, would have at, uh, at sea level. So is that what the pearl divers That's what the pearl divers no There's no tank, no. Um, one of some of the things that they do to help fight this is they change uh, the nitrogen. Uh, they use special gas tanks. If you've ever looked at the big, uh, like, uh, Castor dive boats or the people going down on the Titanic, they have these huge cylinders of gas on the deck. They exchange uh, the uh, nitrogen and they use helium. You still have the oxygen, but you have something that's not nearly as toxic and doesn't come out like nitrogen in the blood. Uh, decompression sickness. Comes up too fast, nitrogen bubbles form in the blood, blocks small vessels. Can happen uh, if an airplane suddenly loses pressure. Um, if you're under a pressurized airplane, the, uh, you know, you're breathing pressurized oxygen and for a sudden reason you lost pressure at 20 or 30,000 feet, the same thing could happen. That's why they're going to get that thing down to under 10,000 feet as fast as they can. I think we're good. But, I promise you, we will finish 16 on Thursday. Okay? Percent? Uh, yeah, I think we'll do it before lab, then as people get done with the lab, then they can, they can get off. I know nothing. I know. I'm telling you, you tested them off with like.